What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then hello. My name is Erica and it is an absolute pleasure to have you joining me today on the channel. Because for today's video, as you can see from the title, I am chatting to none other than Jasmine Elmer. Now, Jasmine, if you guys might have heard that name and you think, well, that sounds familiar, her face is probably going to be a little bit more familiar if you're here in the UK. And that's because Jasmine has graced our screens on TV with her incredibly fun history content on channels like Channel 4, as well as the Discovery Channel. Jasmine also recently released her first solo documentary, which is all about ancient dragons over on History Hit. I cannot recommend this enough, you guys. You guys can find that linked in the description below. If you guys have a subscription to History Hit, you can watch it. Jasmine did such a great job with that. But along with her TV appearances, Jasmine has also been on various radio stations. She has her own podcast called Legit Classics. And yes, we're not done. <laughs> she also has a really fun graphic tea brand, which is called Legit Threads. So Jasmine's mission clearly is to make the classics world accessible. It's to make the classics world fun and to keep it fresh and vibrant for a new audience to encourage so many people, I mean, everybody else that isn't at university to get really stuck into the classics and the ancient world. And today I really wanted to rack her brain about all of that stuff, figure out where that drive came from and what we can expect from her in the future whether that be future projects, future filming projects, future books, whatever it happens to be, we will get to it today. But before we can dive into all of that stuff and really uncover, you know, where this love of classics came from and, and what drives you, why don't we start with your classics background? What is the context that I need to know about you and about how you grew up that would help me understand the classicist, the historian, that is sitting in front of me today. This is funny because I actually, there is an answer, but sometimes you get different answers. And I think it's because like everything in life, I don't think there's one moment where passion just starts and then you move on. There's a like epiphany moment where you're like, oh, this is going to be my life. <laughs> so I'll give you the main answer. But I, in reality, I think it's something that sparked, but then continued in so many different ways. And there was no classics at my school, right? So I went to like a pretty decent but state school in, in East London and we had history, but we never really did anything ancient. Um, it was, they were a great history department, but it was always modern. And I was about 15 and we never really got to go abroad very much because obviously we didn't have a lot of money. So um, a family friend was getting married to an Italian guy and he was uh, he's from outside of, uh, not far from Pompeii basically. Uh, and so the family came over, my my auntie, my uncle, my cousins and me and my mum. And all we went over to this wedding and it's the first time I went to Pompeii. Right. So I'd been I hadn't really even been to many. There's not really much Roman stuff in East London. I didn't really venture far. Um, and I went to Pompeii and it just blew my mind and I couldn't really believe what was going on. And I was walking around it and it's a bit of a weird thing. I don't know if archaeologists feel this, but I could almost feel the energy of it. Like it was, it was exciting. Like I could almost, not, not that I've got some clairvoyance or anything, but I could just feel like, oh my God, people lived here. This is like people's real lives. And it was very, one of the first times I think I came across archaeology and kind of felt the presence of something like, oh my God, this is like a real people touch this stone type thing and walked on these streets. And that sparked it for me. And I was already obsessed with history. So it wasn't like a hard uh, jump from history to ancient history. And I went I went down that route then, really. I mean, I didn't really I couldn't do anything until degree. So there was no there was no A level um, classics or anything like that at my college. So I went to sixth form college. So I was a little bit mad because I don't think many people pick ancient history, archaeology uh, just off the bat. <laughs> especially I've got to be got to be real like if you're from a poorer background you really don't make that choice because you have to think about how Absolutely. am I going to get money out of this I mean no <laughs> and no one can really I mean there's only a couple of routes like if you're going to go into academia teaching whatever you might get yourself a salary but really um but I'm not really like that I've always believed in following my passion so I didn't I just didn't think about it which is probably stupid actually but uh, <laughs> it was really out. not the yeah. way it went <laughs> It worked out in the end, but yeah, so I just, and I, and the other thing is I didn't really do classics. I did ancient world studies at UCL, which is um, a wicked course. I think it still goes now. And it's wicked because it was 
massively accessible. So uh, you could just pick anything in the ancient world almost, which is why I go around saying, although I'm a classicist because my master's is in classics and I was a teacher of classics. So it does remain my specialism, but I did, I started in the entire ancient world and I'm trying to return to that because I think that's a really mm. important like global message that we need to get out there. Yeah, so uh, that's it. And I did my degree and I loved it. And I was like, I can't ever leave this. So then I did a PGCE in classics at Cambridge and became a classics teacher. And that was mainly my career until the last couple of years. I've gone Which too far now. Amazing. Said education. Oh, and well, I did a master's as well. At yeah, um, amazing. Uh, <laughs> when my little boy was born, I thought, I know what's easy, a master's degree with a newborn baby. <laughs> and that turns out to be a ridiculous thing to do. And you it. still did it. I still did it. So it's all good. Still bossed <laughs> it out. But uh, yeah, but, the, you know, very briefly, although that was incredibly long, I uh, have never left the subject not once really, even when I've like dabbled in a couple of other things, it's always been there for me. So uh, it really is a lifelong passion, but I can't really not get rid of it like a disease, but just like it's there forever. <laughs> it's there forever. Like, you're it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I have, there was a, I lie a little bit. There was a brief moment after I had my baby where I thought, shall I be an interior designer or a florist? Those and are then also thought, fun. They are fun. But then I just thought, nah. <laughs> I went back to classics so well speaking of which I so I re-listened to your interview with Liv from last year cool which I listened to at the time which was so fun if you guys haven't listened to it I'll link it in the description below it's all about monsters and volcanoes and lots of fun stuff but in that interview you also mentioned how you've always loved geography yeah so how does that then mesh with classics for you yeah, I mean that's like a great thing about classics it can be best friends with any subject really can't it because we, we cover it all uh, and this is something I used to talk about my t- to the kids with, like, like, what you know, what do you like? We can find it in the ancient world. It's all good. <laughs> Even if they say computers, I'm like, well, we could look at some ancient mathematicians and <laughs> things like that. Uh, the golden ratio and all these things. But geography, I always loved as well. I did geography A level. Um, and I nearly did the sort of second, you know, we all sort of dabble in a second passion in our brains. Like, what is it for you? And it's always nothing to do with the first one. Mm-hmm. And I always loved hazard geography. I've always loved volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, stuff like that. Don't know why. Disaster movie fan here. <laughs> and I nearly did a degree in that. Really? <laughs> Until I realised I don't really like maths or graphs or anything like that, which is a big problem. Very fair, yeah. Um, and so I've always been fascinated about that intersection between geography and classics. And so um, I did actually do a bit of a PhD and I quit it to do the work I'm doing now. So I did. And that was about volcanic activity. Um, but like mythical and rational explanations in in Greece and Rome. So that's where it came from. And it was actually Professor Daniel Ogden at Exeter that um, introduced me to the dragon, which I think we might chat about later. But Mm -hmm. that's where I started finding out a little bit more about monsters and how they relate to landscape. And I found that like, oh, there's like an amazing little niche thing in here that ticks two of my interests. So like, where does it, it's less about, you know, Pausanias and descriptions of the, I'm no, no disrespect to the guy. I mean, but I was, it's less about that for me, although it's super useful. It's more about when people lived and tried to understand their landscapes, what were they thinking? <laughs> That's what I'm fascinated by. Like a volcano erupts and they don't really know what's going on. Of course. It's like, what do they think is happening? Other than just the gods are angry, which is like the generic response, right? It's much more nuanced than that. So I just got a bit obsessed with that for a while and I still am. And that's why I was, it's become a little subgenre of things that I talk about a lot because my uh, master's dissertation focused on it. I was so, going to say, it focused on the chimera, didn't it? It did. It, it was the chimera, the different mythical meanings of the chimera. Your research, your regular your research. <laughs> oh, I'm wondering what else you found out, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, it was on the chimera and like mythical, like, you know, and rational explanations for the chimera, like the symbolism of it. And, um, you know, I mean, the chimera is awesome because what is it? Uh, but <laughs> very basic that's... question, but also <laughs> very I mean, complicated question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the goat. I can't get, I can never focus on anything else other than the goat. It just distracts me when I try and do anything else. Um, but that's where it all began for me. And it's when I started my work in the media, it just seemed like a natural place for me to go to, to look at monsters, not just the the kind of rational landscapey geography stuff, but also how it relates to human psyche and fear because I just kind of love 
you know, we'll get on to this, I guess, but like my whole thing is making it really personal and relatable to human experience. So every time I think about the ancient world, I think about like, <laughs> like the average person and their reaction to something. It's kind of how my brain always wants to go. Mm-hmm. Um, rather than like get into a source and see it from a modern perspective and try and draw it out. I really like to try and imagine myself in those positions and go from that point of view. So um yeah, uh, no, I didn't do that for the Chimera, though. I didn't try to imagine myself <laughs> as the Chimera, but, <laughs> you know, that would have been a bit of a weird one. So that's where it comes in. But I think I don't know about you, but I think that it's a great way for for so many people that don't know classics or never studied it or or, or are intimidated by it. When you, It's like a gateway drug, isn't it? If you, do you, if you like geography, go through geography into classics. If you like theatre, go through theatre into classics. If you like PE, go in through PE into classics. I couldn't and, agree with that more. And I think Absolutely. That's, that's what my teaching career taught me. And that's what I try and do now. Because I think that's so important. Oh, that's really interesting. So you took that from your teaching career and then moved that into media. Yeah. So just what you yeah. do with the kids is now what yeah. you do with everybody yeah. else. Everything I do now in the way I talk to people, adults, children, whoever they are, it's my method is 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 all based in my on my teaching experience you know I was a teacher for 15 years and observing how different people come into the subject so that is there's all there essentially a lot of classics teaching is breaking down barriers <laughs> because you know kids even kids from wealthy back it's not always about who's rich and who's poor it's not always about that it the kids come with barriers usually to what they think it is it's stuffy and it's old and it's white and it's just dull and what is is kind of the distant thing nothing to do with us dusty past you know all those as many adjectives as you want for that and you know my experience was it's our job like my little saying is you've got to go to the people mm-hmm. so what happens in classics a lot is we know it's really awesome so we go like what's wrong with you why don't you even like virgil and then the person over there mr a or whatever is thinking why am I going to come to you? Especially when it's, there's a massive elitist barrier in between it. So mm. I'm all about going over there. And I think one method that always really works is, well, tell me what you like. What do you enjoy? And let's go from there. Let's find that in the ancient world. Would you like to know a little bit more about the origins of that thing or how it, what well, the story of that thing is from then to now? Or And that just works because people, their passions are ignited and they see the connection. And I do it in my podcast. So even my podcast, the concept behind my podcast, Legit Classics, is the same thing. That's why I pick a theme and someone that doesn't know anything because it's the concept of let me go to your passion. That's what I was going to say. I really want to talk about Legit Classics because I love the structure of it. Like I love the idea that you're not talking to a classicist. You're not talking to a historian. You're like, you know, whether it be talking about, oh God, I'm trying to pick one, like like wealthy you know, the wealthy life of an ancient Roman versus the wealthy life of somebody now when you're talking to somebody that knows more about the royal family or whatever it is. I think it's done so brilliantly and such a good way of bridging that gap. So what in the world gave you that idea? (laughs) Well, this is actually also a little story about how my career started because I was just uh, working for Classics for All, the charity. Um, and their job is that they bring classics to state schools. And I was the Devon and Cornwall, like, you know, manager. So I was helping schools in this region get into it. And the chairman of that charity is Jimmy Mulville, who owns Hattrick Productions. So obviously, if you don't know who he is, he's a pretty big deal in the old TV media world. And f- for the very first time, this is the thing about getting out of your comfort zone as well. There is a good, it gets to the point about where, where the idea came from <laughs> in a minute, but so then what, what happened is he heard me speak about classics and accessibility on a radio station, um, which I'd never done before. And I was really scared. I was like, I don't know how to talk about this. I've, despite the fact that I'm a big talker, I was like, there's a difference between sitting with a friend and having a conversation and then putting yourself out there. I was really afraid. I'm not going to lie. This was a few years ago. And I did it. And I just thought I've got to be my authentic self. I can't be anything else. I'm going to try and answer the questions for what I think classicists want to hear, which is always the thing in my head. What do I think people want to hear? And I did that. And then he said, do you want a podcast deal? And I was a little bit like, what's a podcast? Now that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> it was sort of like just 2021 time, I think. And I wasn't really into podcasts, although I was, everyone else was. I didn't, I, I used to just listen to things like Rob Beckett on the parenting hell, because I quite like those things, but I didn't really do much. Um, And then I thought, he said, do, do what you want. Do what you want. Just a classics podcast, go. And that's where it came from. So I sat there and thought, right, this isn't about me. It's about what do I think people 
want to hear and what can I contribute to the world of classics that's a new angle or different and really importantly new audiences that's what I'm all about like people that are like on the edge they're dithering they're like well, shall I shan't I come in and then so that's where the idea came from I thought well let me use my experience as a teacher and let me pick topics that I think are interesting that I think people know they know what they are you know if I say Let's talk about, if, if the title of the podcast, sorry, the title of the episode is Spartan Education. Already some people are like, I don't know what that is. Mm-hmm. But if the title is parent, Parenting, and I weave in some Spartan Education in the conversation like I did with Sarah Turner, um, there you go, boom. I know what parenting is. I will click that because I kind of know what it is. Mm-hmm. Well, kind of, I do know what it is. <laughs> or I might <laughs> experience of it. I'm sure everyone knows what parenting is. <laughs> But I mean, you might be like, I'm a parent. I'm interested in that. Or, you know, wine. I like wine. I'll click that. Rather than, you know, kind of obscure references in in, in literature or what have you. So that was the idea. And, I mean, it did so well. People loved the approach. I mean, obviously, it's a bit bold because it's a bit different. And, and I had to just go on my gut. Did, do I think people are actually going to get it? Are they going to like it? Who's it for? <laughs> Uh, and the celebrity thing was also just about, obviously those people are quite good in being engaging. They have their own audiences. So it's about bringing those audiences into the classics. It's unexpected. Um, but actually I've got news because I'm going to relaunch Legit Classics. And uh, actually the news is being broken here. I haven't told anyone yet. So Ooh. an exclusive for you. Oh my God, uh, stop. I'm going to, I've just finished off my book. So when that's done, I'm going to start recording in February and it'll be out from around about March uh, and it'll be a new series and it will be same, same thing, same concept, but I am going to mix in some expert chats because I'd like to get like down and dirty with some topics that are maybe a bit more provocative. Um, So we'll have a bit of a mix. That sounds very saucy and I'm very excited. <laughs> then that, now I've already done the sex one, which I found incredibly <laughs> awkward, which was so funny because I was trying to be all like, yeah, I'm so progressive. I can talk about this, but in, like, I'm still British. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I don't know about <laughs> That's so <laughs> exciting though. And like, again, like I think it works so brilliantly. And I think, you know, something that you hit on there was knowing the audience was like perfectly knowing who your audience is and yeah. seemingly never losing sight of them like anything that I've seen yes. you do you know you mm. recently did there was like a, a little mini YouTube series that you did with the is it the ROM museum yeah the RAM museum Royal Ram? Amber, I am so sorry Royal museum. that's okay it's the RAM museum it's, it's just the it's just a local museum here in Exeter yeah those videos were so fun because you were li- like there was even one about the first selfie and you were like oh is that a knife oh no it's not okay cool it is supposed to be a, a stylus or whatever like just little jokes being thrown in and the way you so perfectly like work with, I mean, and I say this in the most loving way, like awkward historians, like historians yeah, who are like, yeah, this yeah. is the material and and you're there to be like, we, we can have a little bit of a laugh, yeah. like don't worry about it. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is getting into media, were you yeah. ever met with people that were like, Jasmine, be a bit more serious though? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and I think literally day one, I thought, this might be when I when I had that chat with Jimmy Mulvey and it was like here's a podcast I thought my brain went to immediately like maybe this is a thing like in my brain maybe this is a career and the freak the freak out immediately happened because I'm like what am I going to be though and the first thoughts were like almost like what do people want me to be I'll be that I'll be what what you I'll play the role of what it is and then I did look around at the historians that were doing this work and I and of course there is a there is a variety, but there was a, there is a stock type, you know, of, of historian, like you say, that is kind of quite staid, kind of quite, you know, very direct, serious, quite academic, often white, uh, often male, not always. And I just thought, right, I'll try and copy that a little bit. Like I'll be, a, and I didn't actually do this in the end, but that my brain went there. And then I just went F that. If I'm going to do this, I have to be my full authentic self and I have to give people the real me. And that is what you say is I just try and be my, my I don't overthink it. I just think, what am I, what do I want to say about this? What do I want to do about this? And just it, it, the more I do it, the more I think finesse I can do that with. When I first started, obviously you feel a bit like, well, I don't know what to do with myself, but there are, there's techniques to learn and things. And, you know, some of my earlier stuff's a bit clunky, but I don't, I don't mind that. We've all got to learn somewhere. And I think that, the more I do it, the more I'm like, I'm just going to be me. And yeah, as you know, when you put yourself out there, that's quite scary because you don't know what the reception is going to be, especially someone like me. 
I am outspoken about the fact that I'm mixed race. I'm from a council estate background, but I don't believe in the stuffy approach, really. That doesn't mean I don't uh, admire those approaches. I think there's a place for them. But what bothers me is there's space for more types of history and, and representations of it. So I'm not all about gunning for those people saying you shouldn't be there. I'm like, yeah, you be there. That's great. Like I've got nothing against people who, from from wealthier backgrounds or people who I'm half white. It's not about race for me in that sense. It's just more like we can't. I don't want that domination anymore by that demographic. So like, can we just have pluracy? Can we just have more? Not pluracy. That's the uh, plurality is what I was trying to say. Pluracy is the thing when you get your chest cough thing, isn't it? <laughs> so not that one. Um, <laughs> so uh, just like plurality of approach, just more types of history done by real people that I couldn't agree with that more I think that's so important that idea of also like really appreciating and acknowledging where you have those what I call like awkward historians I love them I talk to them all the time but like the more academic people that are really good as being teachers in a lecture space and you know there is a space for that and that is so unbelievably important to forwarding this subject but it's also important to highlight like you were saying to have that difference like I did the same thing when I started YouTube where I was like, ooh, okay, Mary Beard talks like this and yes. Bethany talks like this. And so I'll do a hybrid and I'll do this. And it was so awkward. Like all those videos are gone because it was just not, <laughs> it just didn't work. I was trying to do something that wasn't me. I couldn't yeah. keep it up by the end of yeah, the video. Yeah, it's like thick and wooden and it feels wrong. Yeah, done that. Done the Done the old videos where I'm just like, Oh my God, there's, there's actually a famous uh, outtake video that only my family have seen uh, <laughs> of what, me trying to practice my cam- early camera work. And I just look annoyed. I was I'm the so, same. It, it's like really pissed off, basically. I'm just like, I want to talk to you about some things. And it was just like, why are we so angry? The poor audience. I did the same, literally the same thing. I have like a little short, like I've clipped it. So it's just my face, but it's the same thing. I'm like, we're going to talk about the Minotaur today. And I watch it back. Like, are are you sure we should be? (laughs) (laughs) No, exactly. Same thing. But you know what? This is good for people to hear because, you know, you always see that polished version. You, You know, when you see a historian on television, for example, and you look at them, you never think they must have started somewhere and they probably were a bit crap. Exactly. And, you know, like, be real about that. We've we never done it before. I've never had, I've got no degrees in camera work. I don't know how it <laughs> works. I'm just trying to like, like, it's like, like where you're looking, what you're saying. Um, and, you know, I think that's a lifelong thing. Like, how are you doing that? How, I mean, I think, you know, we all need to learn and evolve. And I think this it, it's a really important thing for people to know, like, don't let that put you off. Because I think people think in order to burst onto the scene, I need to be the, the finished package. And I think that then, then you become stiff and wooden because you think I've got to be perfect, got to be perfect. And actually, I think just my number one tip of anyone that's doing this stuff is just be authentic as much as possible. Don't overthink it. Like I, I didn't really do Instagram at all before uh, this line of work. I was like old school Facebooker, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then they were like, right, my agent's like, you got to do Instagram. I was like, oh, do I have to? And now I really love it. And it's become a place of like, you know, my my fan base and to talk to people and find out about what they like and it's really great I love it but when I first started I was like I don't know and I would do like something and I get like two likes on it I'm just thinking oh god this is I just can't deal with this and but it's just like that reminder you've got to start somewhere and it's persistence and this sort of authenticity about things that I think is really key you've brought up like such great points in that though that I think I think it's good for people to hear. Like, I think it's a given for us, you know, me on YouTube and you actually in like real media and doing like real things that there is that idea of like, you see the last video or the last project and people have this idea of, well, I can't start yet because I'm not that. And like, there's a huge disconnect there. Cause people always say that to me, they'll be like, I would love to get on YouTube for classics or whatever it books anything and they say yeah. oh but I don't have this or I don't have lighting or I yeah, don't I have get whatever like or, you know I get I get those messages as well on on things how do I start what do I do and and it's it, I totally feel you and I think the other this is where we've got to get into like the, the issue of these people that are usually messaging me are younger and they're from all sorts of backgrounds and one of the issues they don't see themselves in the presenters that they're looking at because we're still in this blip <laughs> where we don't have enough diversity on on screens, in the media, whatever you want to call it, in writing and everything that represent like the, you know, the kind of nice, the variety and spice of life that people are. So I think if you're like 22 and you're looking at 
historians and it's great that this is changing but it's slow it's like who are you going to look up to and go oh yeah I'm, that person's got an accent so I don't need to be like you said you were trying to do your like RP accent or whatever it was so you're trying to, I mean you're very well spoken anyway but I mean no. can't imagine how much more well spoken you were then but yeah you know it's just this sort of you know you I think that that will change it too no I, my hope is in 10 years time or hopefully sooner than that but you know the more of people that are doing this and are just regular folk the more other people are looking, oh, I can do that. Great. That's a viable option for me. No one's saying it's easy. I'm not saying you can just roll up and do it, but that will then change how we present history to people. And I think that would just be amazing. Like, I just want to democratise the whole thing. And I think it links back to an earlier point that you said, which I think is so vital, that so many people, one, don't have the option to study, whether it be literally in their school. So there's that major problem, which thankfully, mm-hmm. thanks to, you know, charities like Classics for All and mm-hmm. various other podcasts, not only yours, but also Lives and whatever it is, people are getting access to it no, sure. early, which is amazing. But mm-hmm. also the key point that something that I always stress on my channel as well, given that, and this comes from my background, like my grandparents, uh, Sicilian immigrants to the US, couldn't speak any English. And so for their children, they were like, you either become lawyer, doctor, teacher, like yeah. something that we can understand. So for a yeah. lot of kids, there is yeah. that also issue of, well, yeah. you don't have the monetary you know, resources to be able to say, well, I'm going to study this and yeah. hope it works out. You've got to go for something that's really safe. Exactly. I get you. And I think that, you know, I've got here, I've got to check my privilege, though, because I couldn't have done this in my 20s. I couldn't have afforded to um there would have been no way that I I mean uh you know I know a lot of people will work full time and then add in these passions to build them up and then perhaps it turns into a career which is obviously the way to do it but I I have to check my privilege now to say that you know I'm older I'm married I'm financially stable with the support of my family that allows me the privilege to get into this and go for my creativity and, and and throw myself into this career properly you know so there's still a problem with that (laughs) and also it's also things like you know there's no transparency anywhere like you know like what's the path Mm -hmm. you ask what's the path for me to get from a to b is it do i need a degree like what type of degree is it what what is it what am i doing you know and i think that there could be a that could be a bit better as well um but you're you know you're dead right that people from you know uh poorer backgrounds will struggle Mm -hmm. more to get into this line of work. And so when I talk about the fact that I grew up in a council estate, that's obviously true. That's my background. That's my experience. But now I'm lucky enough to have more financial stability. Um, so that is why in my position now, as someone in her early 40s with that situation, it's, now it's my job to give back. And that's what I'm trying to do in my work. It's really important to me, like the social justice element of what, what I'm doing. Although it looks like I'm just knocking about. <laughs> I I am serious about helping people come up the ladder. So when if someone messages me or emails me or something, I do reply. I try and give what advice I can. I can't always give them the answer they want, uh, which is like, oh, you do A, B, and C, and then you can mm-hmm. have a, t- a career in television. But I think that um, that's great. And I'll be honest, you know, not that, not that we're bashing anyone particular in the, we never do that in the history world in the media but I, I, I've been very well received and supported by a number of prominent historians in the media and that's been great to see people lifting people up giving advice not doing that openly doing that privately and I won't name them here but they've a number of people have been very supportive of me um and I think that just is testament to even the people within the, feel like maybe they t- tick the boxes in the system you know they might be a bit posh they might be white um, but at the same time, they're like they they recognise that they want change too, uh, and I think that's great. So I think that the landscape is changing. I think it'd be really interesting to see in ten years' time what, where we are. I think we're going to have such a different experience with history, and that's awesome. That's exciting. One hundred percent. I was going to say that as well. That like so when I started doing YouTube it was very much a case of I was working at the pub and then I would like right before going into a shift, I would film a video and then on my break, I would be editing it and then I'd post it the next day. And it was just like four years of that, like nonstop. Maybe and that's why those. you were angry on your early videos. <laughs> <laughs> I was exhausted. I've even had a minor tour, but I haven't slept for two days. I'm so tired. But you know, so like that was yeah. it. And I found that a lot yeah. of people like yeah. Flora was the same way with her illustrations. She was working full time and doing all of that before she could go. And that's why I think it's so important to highlight those that it's not 
easy, but it certainly can be rewarded. And because I think what's so key is I found it with my journey as well. Like when I reach out to professors and say, you know, I'm doing this thing because I want people to have access to you. Like, I think that's really important. Yes, it is. They are so, so, like, everyone is so supportive. Massively desperate for it almost. A lot of the time they really want to do it. They're so excited to get on camera. They're like, yes, ask me any, like, any question at all. I will answer it. No such thing as a stupid question. Let's go. Yeah. And I think something, I don't know how you would label yourself if you ever, you know, (laughs) not that you put it on your passport, who you are anymore, (laughs) but, you know. And I think for me, I've settled on public historian because I'm not an academic. I don't work in university. I don't have a PhD. Um, so I feel like I'm the bridge. And obviously public historian is a real thing. There are lots of them out there. But I feel like I'm the bridge between the general public and the academic. I understand the academic, their work, what they're doing. And I know how to dissect that information Hope, hopefully <laughs> I think you do so, like, brilliantly no, she, no, she's rubbish but okay the plan is that I dissect that and then make it palatable to the uh the general public you know and also like I said I'm specifically interested in marginalized communities and people that don't usually come to classics etc uh as part of my kind of you know focus but um and I think that that's 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 another thing to for people to think about you don't have to be I, I don't have a PhD and I'm doing TV and that's cool. It's not, no, no one's come up to me and gone, Jasmine, well, where's your PhD? Except for America. America's a bit different. They like, they do like their, their titles over there. Um, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't think uh, it's a no in America or anything like that. If you don't have a PhD, but I think that they're particularly interested in your uh, background, but of course I'm about to become an author. So there's, they like the labels. So that then it would just be Jasmine Elmer author, you know, um, there's a validation in that. Right, they're like a comma there. They want to put yeah, something exactly. after the comma. <laughs> exactly. So I think that um, public historian is a really good space for people to consider what that might be to them without a, a PhD. I mean, you need to have some background, right, and understanding in order to, I wouldn't say without a degree. I mean, you could easily, you don't have to have a degree in it. I don't, I would never say that to anyone. There's no barriers there. People who self-learn, self-teach, that's totally fine by me. But obviously, I think you feel more confident if you've got a degree in the subject area. But, you know, what whatever happens, happens for people. And that's great. But I think that's a good space. Public historian. That's my that's my that's what I say to people. If people ask me, because I've dabbled in about 50 different words because for ages. I didn't know because it's just evolved. It's like gone. And I'm like, oh, OK, what am I now? We're doing now. And as a public historian, you just mm. put out your first solo documentary. So I did. Let's talk about dragons. Tell me about where this came from. Did you yeah. pitch it to History Hit, or yeah. were you yeah. kind of like in there for a while and then you went finally got an idea? Like, how did that come about? Yeah. So it came about originally because my agent contacted the team there and said hello, <laughs> and then uh, eventually we got a meeting. And in that meeting, this is usually how TV things go, by the way. You tend to, you, I mean, if you've got an agent, it's much easier um, because you have better access, obviously, to the individuals that have the power to make decisions. If you just email them randomly, I'm not sure how it goes. So, you know, an agent's a good way forward. (laughs) But an agent put me in touch and then we had a meeting and essentially, uh, and I have my document of ideas. These are all ideas that I come up with. I might just be out on a walk and I think, oh, that'd be cool or that'd be cool. And I put them on a document. And because I had studied ancient dragons as part of my master's and had a really good relationship with Daniel Ogden, who's in the uh, documentary too, who's super cute and awesome. So adorable. Perfect yeah, he's so adorable. So and we're cute. Like, we just don't make any sense. There I am with like big pink, like this, pink earrings and my like yo, yo, yo style. And then he's this like kind of very a typical professor type, but we're actually friends and we get on very well as well. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I just knew it would be a great dynamic. But also the dragon was something I'd, I'd never done it. I mean, you'd done it at school. I didn't really know anything. And then I came to it at Masters and I thought, bloody hell, this is there's so much depth in this. And I also thought, I, I think people would be re- like, people like dragons. <laughs> so when I was thinking about the themes, I was like, people will know this and like it. And I, I know how big fantasy is and gaming. And there's always a dragon in those as far as I know. I'm not into it, so I'm just guessing, <laughs> right? So I thought dragons will be a great thing to pitch. And I wanted, again, the... the it to be the thematic, like the story of the dragon. I want us to go back from what we think of the medieval dragon and go back into like, where's it all start? Uh, Mesopotamia. And I wanted it to be broad. I didn't want to just do ancient or just do you know, medieval and then to go through the whole thing. 
Uh, so I pitched that idea and they loved it. And so that's how that, then they said, let's make it. It obviously takes ages to sort it out. So it took about almost a year, I think, uh, to from maybe a bit less than that, but certainly almost a year from, yes, we're going to do this to we're filming it. Wow. So TV, no, <laughs> people. So if you've got an idea for a TV show, it will take you a long time to make it. It's always like that. Um, and yeah, and so we filmed it in the summer, late summer. And it was my first one where, so I'd kind of had put, I, it, I, my, my name isn't on the production credits, but essentially it was my idea. I pitched it. I worked out what I wanted to talk about. And then obviously the production team and a great director, they took it away and put it together, like, you know, properly. And then off we went and I loved it. It was great fun to do. It's a gr- I feel like it's a great topic. Um, it's got, it's, it's done incredibly well on their platform. It's got lots of, uh, lots of view, high viewing figures, lots of lovely comments. I mean, a lot of the comments are, we want more. Mm-hmm. And I have to acknowledge on this for anyone that's watched it and uh, got a bit cross because it's only 25 minutes long or so. And there are dragons we have missed out for obvious reasons because you can't do it all. So we didn't have time to do the Welsh dragon. And I and I think it was left out because it is its own topic. I mean, although of course it relates to what we were talking about, there's so much more to the Welsh dragon. And of course not Eastern dragons. We didn't look at the Far East and Chinese dragons and uh, Japanese. And so uh, maybe scope for uh, some uh, part twos or whatever. Uh- <laughs> I mean, I was going to say, so I watched it the day it came out. I was so excited. Uh, well done, top fan. Literally, I was like, oh my God, Jasmine dropped the da- the dragon documentary. I must go and learn about dragons. <laughs> and so I got my dad to watch it with me because my dad's quite a history buff. And I was like, oh, nice. watch this. And at the end of it, my dad literally was like, okay, when's part two? And I was like, there <laughs> is no part two. And he was like, what? Like, he was so <laughs> taken with the story. He was like, oh, good. well, now what? And I was like, you know what? What a positive reaction that you're yes. having irritation Thank that there's you. no Thank part you, two. <laughs> and thanks from me. Yeah, I mean, that's great. I mean, as if you make something and you've come up with the idea, first of all, so like just for the idea, because a lot of this, like I said, is gut feel. I think I think people are going to like this, but it's based on like nothing except for gut. I don't go around doing like a survey of 100 million people and like, I don't, so I'm just like, there's always a bit of me going, this might not work. <laughs> Maybe it was they such a brilliant stuff. idea. Like it was hmm. like, like you were so right on that gut instinct. Cause I am someone that has never looked into dragons. I've never yeah, been interested because, in it. They've always yeah. kind of been there, but I think that's yeah. when, you yeah. know, you said dragons. I was like, interesting yeah. that there's a history of dragons and going into, yeah. you know, and like yes. seeing all these medieval pieces and like discussing yeah. like how it evolved. I was really taken by it as someone that like just sees them in fantasy. I was like, hold on. I didn't realize there was so much here. Before I did anything with Daniel Ogden, I had no idea. I was just like, it's just a thing, isn't it? And I just lived my life. I had no idea that it was the snake and it was so ancient. I just found that fascinating. And there was so much we can cover, but yeah, I mean, maybe a follow up, but history hit a great. I've done a bit more. I'm doing a bit more with them now. So that'll be a place that I think you'll see me a lot more. Uh, on TV podcasting that sort of thing um but I think they're an amazing platform because you know in first of all they can self commissions so that's great so they can kind of do their own thing and I think that that means that they're making they, they they've got the freedom to take bolder decisions whereas in TV commissioning when you get to the big channels uh it can be challenging to get something commissioned uh, there's a lot of competition sometimes reticence over new ideas whereas like you take it to them and because they're like the home of history really now <laughs> Netflix uh, for history that they can they can kind of be broader and kind of give things a go because <laughs> I got history hit like because of your documentary because I really wanted to watch it so I was like okay now I'm coming into it and I didn't realize like as you were saying how incredible a platform it is and how yeah. much on there there is and how there are so many different series and like any person you think of like poli- like mm-hmm. whether it be ancient political person whether it be just history whether it be monsters whatever it is yeah they've got a little doc on it I mean awesome when you're doing your degree you don't have to do the reading you could just watch one of those <laughs> exactly <laughs> and actually a lot of the it, I mean I don't want to it's a great platform but it, it's also an incubator for historians new historians as well so it's a good place for people to start out when they're getting their own ideas you, you just must be so proud of yourself for dragons. Like you just must be. Yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? I am proud of myself. I'm, I, uh, again, this is a thing that I've learned being, I want to say an older woman, because that's not old, but I just mean like something that I found hard in my twenties and my thirties is to celebrate myself. When I've got to my forties, I'm like, stuff that I'm doing it. <laughs> and I am really good at, it's so easy to criticize, isn't it? And go like, well, okay, well that, that. And I just don't really allow that anymore. I'm like, sure, some of those things can be true, whatever. But I am really proud of myself um the 
continual thread of putting myself out of my comfort zone is insane. And something I haven't spoken about much, which I'm a very open book, is that this has followed uh, postnatal depression and years Mm. of anxiety. And that's something that I didn't experience in my younger life, but experienced after my son was born. Uh, We had a pandemic, obviously, we're all in that. That has massive uh, implications for mental health. So I'm not only coming at this, you see me now as this, and this is, this is real, uh, but it's, I've come from very dark times. So I've had to come out of that into this. So you can imagine the, the, the the difficulty from that perspective, all the way into fully out of your comfort zone. So the very first filming I ever did was for Channel 4. And it was when I contributed to the Lost Treasures of Rome. And I had to fly out to, um, I, just, I, like, I had to fly out. <laughs> it's a so, hard load. Like, <laughs> because, oh, dear me. No, but okay, so ignoring that part of it, which sounds like proper dodge, but I was really, up, I was really, really anxious is what I was trying to say. I was traveling in the pandemic. I hadn't been abroad. I didn't like flying. I had panic attacks. It wasn't great, right? And I did it. But I did it, and then every time I did it, a little bit of that anxiety would go. And obviously, don't get me don't get me wrong. I had to, I've had help. I don't I don't want to tell people to throw themselves into things when they're not able to. Or, but for me, this work sort of led me into my power, and now it's great. I, but I have had to each time go out of my comfort zone. So the the, the dragon's dog that's my first go alone. It's not just me contributing for a little bit. It's me doing my own show and it's my idea so yes I am really proud of it because I know how far I've come and that's That's, amazing that's really interesting then if you don't mind if we could actually like stick with that so my background I went to rehab at 16 had like six years of therapy all of this like I'm Mm -hmm. very healthy now don't worry guys but still came (laughs) off (laughs) you know still came off the back end of having some really troubled years relapsing Mm -hmm. all of this ugly stuff And I'm Mm. curious for you coming out of, you know, coming with anxiety and all of that, coming into something where you have to look at yourself on camera, you have to be in front of a camera, you've got to present yourself in a certain way. What was your relationship like with yourself and how did that change as you Mm. got more used to that? That's a fantastic question. So I think that uh, I am someone that has always been very determined whatever I've done. And in some ways, doing that with this work brought me back to myself because that's a natural trait inside me that I had lost. So essentially, I'd become quite fearful. And it was all about facing fears for me. And the more I faced fears, the the, the smaller they became. And so my anxiety, now I don't suffer with anxiety. I haven't had anxiety for a while. Um, and it does not to say I don't feel anxious feelings like all human beings do, but that I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go around saying now that I suffer with anxiety, although I might have done that two years ago. Um, and I think that f- for me, when I, if I see myself on camera, like I, I have a very, it's, very, it's funny, if I see myself on camera, I don't have any anxiety about what it, I don't ever have a thought like, oh, that's rubbish or anything like that. I look at it and I just go, I, I can be quite uh, critical, but in, in the right way, positive. Like, okay, next time I'd be a bit like that. Or that take, I, I think I'd rather be a bit like that. What am I learning from it? But without being pernickety, just in general. Because basically I've just got to have fun. If I don't have fun, it's over, game over. And I think that's very, any job you do. And I, I know we've got to pay the bills, I get that. But f- try and work your way to a job that brings you joy. And that's that's what's happened with this job. The more I've done it, the more joyful I'm. So grateful for it. I love every minute of it. There's not one bit that I go, oh. But there have been challenging times. Um, so, and I don't know about you, and obviously your situation sounds very different to mine because it's probably an ongoing relationship that you will always have with your situation. Um, and I'm aware that at any point, now I've experienced that sort of thing, it could come back. But I just have like a... Um, you know, I have, I think I have a really good team around me supporting me and I just try and enjoy it. And honestly, a little bit of it is don't take it too seriously. You can take yourself very seriously in this line of work. And and I just think don't take yourself too seriously. I think that's so healthy. Like, that's and that's actually how I go and about it's true. it. As well. I don't lie about anything. I never do that. I'm, I'm fully you ask any of my mates, I've been like this my whole life. I'm I'm very honest. I really believe it's important to be honest. So I'm not saying I didn't look at one thing and think, oh God, what's happened there with my hair or something. Of course I did. I'm not I'm not gonna have to say I've got no thoughts, but I give them no power. I just go, oh whatever. Forget about it. <laughs> and even then, like looking at things like you were saying that 
can easily be changed. Like I do that all the time, like not nitpicking, like, oh my God, my eye squinted at this moment. And like, <laughs> oh my God, does my eye do that all the time? How embarrassing. Or like, mm-hmm. for example, I have a vein that pops out on my forehead, which I'm always like, oh no, the vein popped out. But you know, you could spend ages looking at that and being like, I can never be on camera think- again. How embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. And just mm-hmm. let that thought, you know, take you instead of going, okay, mm-hmm. well, actually what I was saying was great. My hair looked adorable. So <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Also, oh, I actually say is no one gives a crap about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the, that's the key. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's fine. I don't really, I mean, I think there's that thing, you know, uh, body image is another thing I talk about sometimes. I'm actually going to do a pod on it. I think I'll do an episode on it. Um, So it'll come out and I'll talk about my own stuff there. But I think, um, yeah, I think it's just, just like be your best mate because you're in your head all the time. And I think when it comes to mental health difficulties outside of those that need medication and therapy. Of and course, other, that's the disclaimer on this yeah, whole conversation. Yeah, the disclaimer guys. because I'm not in, people need, I've had all sorts of people helping me, so it's important. Um, but what I would say is just that now that I'm through it, my general way of talking to myself is try and be your own best mate. Because I love what, how you say that. I, I say... I'm on my own. I, have, I mean, I've got an agent and stuff, but I'm making this happen. I, I love how you say that though, because yeah. I say, be your own big sister. That's what oh, I always okay. say to people. So we're very similar in that way. Now I'm an only child, but I get the impression of sisters are a bit annoying though. So I've just- I don't have an older one. Sister. I'll be honest. Okay. <laughs> I have a young, I am the older sister. She could probably be like, don't be an older sister. Oh my God. <laughs> I've got no idea. Okay. So one, thank you for being so open about that. I really do appreciate oh, no it. No but there are two things that I do want to- I don't think that we can actually wrap this up without discussing these things. First of all, legit threads. Yeah. Let's talk about legit threads because what a fun project that you have going on the side. Yeah. I just, (laughs) one day I was in my uh, period where, as I've just explained to you, things take ages in this, in this industry. So if you're writing a book, it takes ages. Like this book comes out and you see this person go, woohoo. And like, you know, two years ago, they were like sweating over their like computer and probably having a panic attack. Um, so there, there was these sort of minute, there was these bits of time where I was like, that thing hasn't happened yet. I'm waiting for it. I'm sort of waiting. And I thought, well, what can I create now that will just go out there now? And I just, obviously I'd already had this legit thing because I thought it was quite funny because obviously it's a Latin word as well. And it's a very East End word, like legit. <laughs> I don't know if, not nowadays, I imagine, but it is to me. Very London, isn't it? Legit. <laughs> and also because I'm honest, trying to keep it real. So it made sense. And then I thought, why don't I just do some designs? I'd seen quite a few classicists that you've had a lot of them. You know, Laura Jenkinson, for example, is a really good friend of mine. So I, I've i seen her do it. And I can't draw. <laughs> I'm rubbish. I, it's like, what can I do? What I can do is think of funny little things. So I thought, let me think of funny little things that are about having a laugh and go from there and I just thought up a few of the designs I've done and it's really fun and people love wearing them and you know I think you know it's it's having a little business on the side like you know you learn about what people want and what they don't want I've tried to keep it as cheap as I can but it's really important to me that it's sustainable and made with organic cotton and the printing is all vegan uh because I'm very like I'm I'm a spiritual person so I believe in like you know trying to do my best for the planet etc so I was like I didn't want to put some crap out there that's a tenner, uh, isn't good quality, but also is uh, damaging the planet. So there's all of that that I need to. So, and then, you know, I just like to play designs. I think of a new idea. Sometimes I put it up there. My fa- my personal favorite is still minted with the coin because I just think it's too funny. <laughs> can't help it. But, you know, what I find is that the ones that um, do really well and people really like are the ones that have a feminist take, you know, like the ones with goddesses. Um, and I think that that's, that's, like, I want people to wear it and, like just have a laugh with it you know like kind of like show that show them have fun with it they're great gifts obviously if you've got a bit of time before Christmas like a day and you know it's it, I would say that like it's just a way of me putting another way out there for people to enjoy themselves and have a little laugh with something and I guess get my creativity out which is it keeps growing at the moment so <laughs> And then you mentioned that it's because there's a long time in between things like writing. Oh, yes. I wonder what things could be <laughs> being written. Maybe your book, uh, Goddess with a Thousand Faces. Yes. Can you exactly. tell us more about that? I can, finally. It's about to be, uh, it should be announced very shortly, um, officially, but I can talk about it. So I have my very first book. It's nonfiction, historical nonfiction, Goddess with a Thousand Faces. 
And uh, some of you might know Joseph Campbell, who had Hero with a Thousand Faces in the 1940s. And I, it's a little piss take on that, really. But um, it's 10 different goddesses from either. All of them have ancient origins, but some of them are still contemporary goddesses still worshipped in countries today. They're from all over the world. So cultures that you will recognise, but also you probably have no background in. Um, so you might recognize Kali from India, obviously as a major world goddess, or Artemis from ancient Greece. But what you won't have probably heard of is Rangda from Bali. Or exactly, you're like, who? I'm like, what? <laughs> Tommy, she is she's kick-ass. Freya, Norse goddess, Sedna, Inuit. So I kind of take you around the world in these different each chapters, different goddess. And it is reta- it's a retelling. So it's a retelling that's based on real source material. Uh, but what it's what's fresh and new, and I don't I don't want to make big bold claims like this has never been done before because it might have been, but I don't think it has. Uh, but what's new, a new way of doing history for me is the storytelling mixed with the historical context. So what I do is I give you the story, a story of that goddess, and then you get the historical context of that culture. So you, if you don't know like, a bit about ancient Greece or ancient Egypt or whatever culture it is that we're talking about in that chapter. But the whole point of it is I want people to reclaim their femininity through these goddesses. So the whole thread of it is, although, yes, it's a history book, yes, it's goddesses, yes, it's got, you know, this learn about this culture, learn about this story, but the thread of it and the point of it is very, very much like the reflection of yourself in the goddess. So elements of our femininity that have we haven't reclaimed today. So, for example, uh, if a woman um, is overly sexual today, and then she gets damned for that. It's about like showing you how ancient goddess, an ancient goddess, for example, l- learning her story, uh, reclaiming that part of yourself and making it okay. So it's that sort of thing. And we, it's all different types. So in lots of ways, it's the story of womanhood told through these goddesses. Um, and it is bold and it is different. Uh, you're de- I, don't, I don't know anything like it. Um, and I'm so proud of it because, again, it's one of my big ideas. And you know what it's like for I'm a classicist, but also have got my ancient world background from my undergrad. Um, and I've always, always dabbled in all ancient cultures in my study. But, you know, the first thought was like, what? Like people don't tend to go across the world like that because they want to stay in their specialisms. They're like, well, actually, I know all about the Athenian Navy. So I'm going to write a book about the Athenian Navy and stay there. But I wanted to be brave enough to go out of that and just go, let's go big, go big or go home. And honestly, I've loved writing it. It's done. It'll be out in September 2024. Oh, my God. So is the best place for people to then keep on top of that your Instagram? Yeah, Instagram will will be where I always post any announcements. But I do. I'm quite good at my website as well. I'm quite good at updating it for information when it comes up. Um, So hopefully it'll be on there. But yeah, Instagram will be all the where it's at. And that is actually a great time to tell everybody that you can find those links in the description below, as well as links to History Hit, where you can sign up, get a subscription in order to watch Jasmine's incredible Dragons doc over there. I wish I could tell you guys that I had some kind of a promo code. I do not. However, it is absolutely worth it. I loved as you guys have heard loved the documentary so I really cannot recommend it enough now thank you Jasmine obviously for joining me today it means a lot that you decided to sit down so we could finally chit chat on camera and tell everybody about the incredible feats that you've made in media tv podcasting all of that to make classics so accessible and Again, I want to reiterate a huge thank you for being so honest and so vulnerable throughout this conversation. I think I think it'll do some some good for people who are listening to this that are really going to relate to you. And I think that's really beneficial. So thanks for that. Thank you guys for watching this episode. And we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Moaning. So I'll see you guys then.